Hello and welcome to this week's show and uh, as we said last week when we were looking at Smokey and the Bandit we're going to look at the sequel Smokey and the Bandit 2 from 1980. Now as sequels go this is a bit rough and the reason I think that it wasn't really what was expected is that it had a very large budget. If you remember, the first movie only cost about three and a half million dollars to make, but it made nearly a hundred million uh, in its full time of release. And on the strength of that, Hal Needham could do no wrong and was given bucketfuls of cash, fifteen million dollars in point of fact, to create a sequel. And with that much money, you do tend to overdo it. And on the strength of this, as Burt Reynolds said uh, in a great many interviews um, over a period of time, Sally Field also mentioned it uh, in some of her interviews, that there wasn't a script. I mean, there was a story, but there wasn't a script, and everybody was making it up as they went along. And uh, you would think for $15 million dollars, you'd have a script, right, at the very least. So there wasn't one of those. They were making it up as they went, and they may have overcompensated with unnecessary action. Yeah, I know, I can't believe I've even said the phrase unnecessary action, bearing in mind that this channel is devoted to action, unnecessary or otherwise. Uh, having said that, I think that this uh, is probably guilty of that in a couple of occasions. We're going to look at some of those moments today. There aren't many. If the truth be known, uh, there's probably three or four sequences that we're going to look at, um, and uh, but the rest of it is kind of made up with many traits that they tried to use in the previous film. Some of them successful, some of them not so much. Um, don't get me wrong, it, this movie wasn't a flop at the box office. It made over $60 million, so it was a box office success. But, uh, you know, you just think to yourself, well, because the first one was so sensational, maybe this one could have done better. And I think, in hindsight, it probably could have done um, it was filmed in conjunction with Cannonball Run, uh, which is why Dom DeLuise turns up in it, and uh, there's a few other familiar faces knocking about in this picture as well. Uh, stunt coordinator-wise, Alan Gibbs wasn't available because he was just spreading himself very thinly. I think he was on everything uh, at one point during uh, 1979 and most of 1980. So consequently, uh, Dick Zyker takes over as stunt coordinator, and a great many of the uh, action sequences are down to him thinking on his feet uh, with uh, Hal Needham and saying, I've got a good idea, why don't we do something like this? And on the strength of that, they went ahead. Um, but anyway, let's have a quick look at what goes on action-wise in Smokey and the Bandit 2. So we start with this part, which is uh, the jump over Buford's car. Uh, Bobby Sargent is behind the wheel with Janet Brady. But heavy landing again. I mean, these Trans Ams, although built for speed, certainly not built for jumping. And uh, apart from Bobby and Janet wearing... Uh, five point harnesses in there. I wouldn't have thought there was going to be a great deal else that they could have done to uh, beef up the suspension a little. I mean, you want to, you, you, it needs to give obviously to take the shock out. But look again, then it's nose heavy, nose hits first. Oh, there's the bonnet changing shape, and of course, that's going to stick its nose up in the air. I mean, it's uh. It's very brutal. There's no. It does. We'll we'll have another look at another one later on because it does. It is a similar exercise later on. You can see the shape that is left. But of course, they can just pick and choose. They've got about half a dozen different transams to play with. Uh, this particular scene, another. I don't know, but the circus must be in town. <laughs> another example of Bobby Sargent's work here. Um, but Daddy, the bridge. I can make that. And so off he goes to jump the bridge very slowly and gets trapped across the two. Now, 
He then realizes and says, get out and push, Junior. He says, but Daddy, get out and push. And so Junior opens the door and, Junior being a bit daft, steps out and falls into the drink. Well, Bobby Sargent does that and he's got to change his position. And he changes position. Look, it's a forward, he's diving forward, then has to rotate in the air uh, so that he will land in the water. This water, of course, has to have been checked beforehand. Divers will have had to have been in there to make sure that it was clear. He's not landing on any old cars or concrete or big, you know, rocks or something that will uh, certainly injure him along the way. So all of that needs to be checked. And uh, it's a lovely little entry. He's done very well there. Uh, probably takes some points away. There's quite a bit of splash going on there. Uh, judges are quite harsh these days when it comes to splash. Having said that, it was very nicely done indeed. I enjoyed that. Um, and uh, his high work is something that he's been doing for many, many moons. Uh, behind the wheel, of course, of the Trans Am again here is Bobby. And uh, driving through or underneath um, a roller coaster for reasons better known to somebody else, apart from the fact that obviously they're driving through the uprights of said roller coaster, and uh, bang, hits the floor. Well, just look at it again. You see the front end of that hit the ground. Look at it bending up in the air. Look, let's just change, change shape completely. Um, when uh, Hal realised that... Uh, yeah, look, look at the nose sticking up in the air. Hal realised that this was going to be disused or demolished. Hey, we'll do it for you. And, of course, as soon as uh, they drive through the underside of it, down she comes, a helicopter shot just to catch the whole thing. You don't want to catch it all from one angle. There it is. There's the aerial shot. As the whole thing falls down beautifully. Um, now, this is the demolition derby sequence um, as the cars split in half. Bobby Sargent in the red one here. Other side is stuntman Bob Miner, and they're reversing at speed at a pipe ramp. Well, Bobby is anyway, because he's going to turn over. Way Look at that. Uh, Bob kind of straddled his, and it went straight up in the air. Again, cars turning over. Little cheeky ramps knocking about. There's, there it is, just hooked on the back of the upturned vehicle. Um, another nice little gag here where this is not secured, and it rolls off. Uh, this car um, is kind of stripped and drives through the other side. Now, here, we've got a concealed ramp. This is Bobby Sargent again. There's the ramp concealed by the car. Look. He comes up in the red car, up, through, and out the other side, landing on the police car. This one, on the other hand, is serious. This is Gary Davis. He is doing, I would say, 60, 70, 75 plus when he hits that ramp. And uh, he lands. It's just leveling off now. Look, coming down and front back. Oh, that's heavy. Broke his back on landing. Serious, serious situation there. And uh, they... Uh, Wow, he was out for, for some time, but that was a big jump. And then they've created these. Look, there's a little pipe onto the wagon there. Again, this has all been done before in the previous movie, but it's a nice little routine. And then the car leaves here. And then there's a series of vehicles here. Bert hits the anchors, disappears backwards. And then this gag, if you remember, was from uh, Electric Horseman. Uh, Conrad Parmesano uh, did this in the in the picture. Well, there we go. That's it. That is Smokey and the Bandit 2. I hope that's answered some of your questions um, uh, pertaining to that particular one. More next week. No, don't panic. We're not going Smokey and the Bandit 3. No, we're not. No. Um, I think it's best we stick at the first two. I'm not going to tell you what's next week. Bit of a surprise. So uh, until then, take care for now. Bye-bye.